This boy, Alexander Spesivsev, was born in 1970 in Siberia. And since the 1990s, he's been living in a high-security psychiatric hospital in Russia. He's now 54. And the reason for his stay there can be traced back to the summer of 96. During that time, the first signs of an evil presence within the city of Novokuznets where he lived arose, when severed body parts of numerous unidentifiable children were found washed up on the banks of the river Abba. Eventually, an unknown serial killer was dubbed as a Novokuznets monster. It turned out that this man was part of an idiosyncratic family, a family whose world revolved around protecting each other. It was this close-knit dynamic involving his mother Ludmilla, his older sister Nadezda plus himself, that allowed him to avoid detection for years. However, that protective bubble was about to pop. Hi there my friend, I'm Royston and welcome back to the channel. To understand these weird relationships we need to go back to the beginning. The main culprit was Alexander who was known by his nickname of Sasha. So that's how we refer to him. But, I do need to provide a warning that some of the crimes he committed, you know, the details of them, are horrifying. They might even trigger some viewers. Now, if you plan to stick around, please be prepared for that, as this is the story of Alexander Spesivsev, the Novokuznets monster. Sasha was born with health-related problems that almost cost him his life. Fortunately, or unfortunately for some, he survived. He wasn't only as healthy as to contend with. His father was described as a violent man who frequently tortured the family while often cheating on Sasha's mother. After a horrible 15 years of marriage, his mum divorced this vile character who then disappeared and was never seen again. Sasha found comfort sleeping with his mum from a young age, and this highly unusual behaviour continued until he was 12. The relationship he entertained with both his mother and his older sister as he was growing up could be considered an idiosyncratic one. I mean, people within their community looked upon them as a, as a peculiar family. They kept themselves to themselves and didn't really associate with others. But Sasha did find enjoyment in tormenting their neighbours despite suffering with ill health. It plays firecrackers in lifts or paint graffiti on walls displaying antisocial behaviour. Yet his mother never punished him for that kind of stuff. However, in school he was timid. It was a place where bullies wouldn't leave him alone. Novokuznets was an industrial city in Siberia, Russia that suffered social problems during the 80s and 90s. Its factories and coal mines went bankrupt causing genuine survival issues. Children who ran away from home saturated the streets begging for money or food. Most of these runaways preferred living on the street as their home life was barbaric. Yet the winter months were extremely harsh. Parents, particularly fathers, were difficult to live with. Sasha and his sister Nadezna knew what that meant. After their mother's divorce, she found work at a local school but was sacked for stealing, yet managed to secure another job working in a public prosecutor's office, and she was working there with her daughter. Both women were respected and committed to their roles, but never associated with work colleagues. They preferred sticking together. Every day after work, they made their way straight to their apartment. Sasha, his mother and sister, were somewhat reclusive. Ludmilla was captivated by the criminal case she learned about in her office and regularly brought them home. They included images of crime scenes. Injurious people suffered. As well as pictures of dead bodies. And let's not forget, this was when Sasha was very young. Instead of reading children's stories to her son, she chose to share these macabre photographs with him. It's no surprise that he began to show signs of increasing sadistic tendencies. Together, they'd spend hours pondering these detailed accounts. In fact, they even made a scrapbook containing their favourite images. 
Sasha later explained that looking at photographic material of corpses gave him a peculiar feeling that he found pleasurable. His mother's obsession clearly rubbed off on him. When he turned 21, his mother and sister moved out as they found a place closer to their work environment. And although Ludmilla felt her son was self-sufficient enough to live alone, she had doubts about his ability to find and hold down a job. Therefore, she visited regularly to make sure he was doing okay, making a shopping list and purchasing food for him. At some point, he got himself a dog, allegedly a Rottweiler, that he took for daily walks and one day met a 17-year-old woman named Evgenia. He was smitten and demonstrated this by romantic gestures, offering her roses, chocolates and even writing poems. They developed a relationship that made his strange family happy that he'd found someone. The relationship, though, took a turn for the worse when the couple started arguing, leading to Sasha displaying violence against her. And as a result, Evgenia ended the relationship, which deeply upset him. Rather than letting her go home, he kidnapped the young woman, who became his prisoner. She was held for a few weeks, being tortured. After a while, the girl's mother reported her missing, and the police responded and before long they managed to track the location of Sasha's place. However, they had to kick the door down to gain entrance because he refused to let them in. Shockingly, they found Evgenia in a terrible state. She was bedridden with serious health implications and rushed to hospital. Despite the best efforts of doctors, a 17-year-old died. Officially, she died from sepsis, but her old body was covered with what can only be described as intentional wounds with copious amounts of pus oozing out of them. Sasha was consequently charged with murder, and at the age of 21 was assigned to a psychiatric hospital, where he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. After three short years, he was discharged, as doctors were satisfied with his progress. Something unthinkable happened during his discharge when hospital staff made a massive error by failing to complete the necessary papers, meaning he was out but paperwork suggested he was still in the psychiatric facility. And this blunder had serious implications. Once out, he began associating with transients and beggars while developing a hatred for street children. Children he viewed as a byproduct of Russia's emerging democracy. When he returned to his apartment, he invited all kinds of people in to eat or smoke with him. It was also an opportunity to share his views on democracy. During the summer months, his flat gave off a foul odour, and music was always blaring away. This created suspicion with his immediate neighbours, as they suspected something was seriously wrong. One of them contacted the authorities about this. However, the police decided it wasn't worth their time or attention to investigate. What people didn't realise was, Sasha had already started killing adults, hence, that foul smell. This small, unassuming man was not of any real interest to anyone apart from his mother and sister, as the three of them were totally dysfunctional. But his neighbours did report he was often seen walking around Nova Kuznets with his Rottweiler, no doubt looking for another victim. By now, he'd grown tired of killing adults and switched his attention toward children. In the spring of 96, he lured six 12-year-old boys into his apartment, offering them cigarettes and money. Once the final boy had entered and closed the door behind him, their worst nightmare began. They were all murdered and left in that condition for at least four days. Not long after this, his mother visited, noticing their corpses, unbelievably, Rather than experiencing shock or horror, as most people would have done, her response was to help clean the mess up by dismembering them, becoming his accomplice. In actual fact, Sasha went to bed when she arrived, and when he woke up the following day, all signs of the bodies were gone. 
In criminology, a distinction is made between offensive dismemberment, where that's the primary objective, and defensive dismemberment, in which the motivation is, well, it's to destroy evidence. Now, it seems Ludmilla was using defensive dismemberment in an attempt to protect her son. She then placed the decaying flesh into a couple of buckets, and during the night, walked to the school area where she once worked. And what she did there was empty the gruesome remains into the River Abba. Now, if you think that was bad, you'd be shocked to find out just how deeply involved she was. In September 96, three girls who were friends aged between 13 to 15 entered a grocery store in Novikuznets. A woman described as being in her 60s approached them, asking if they could help carry a number of shopping bags to her flat, which was close by. They agreed. The innocent-looking older woman was aware of something that the girls had no idea about, and that was that a serial killer dubbed the Novikuznets monster lived in that apartment. She knew he'd be excited to see these youngsters and would, without question, murder them. In the meantime, bodies were piling up in the flat to the point where Sasha and his mother were struggling with the cleanup. It was time-consuming trying to dismember, fill buckets and walk to the river. They also hated using the lift, meaning they had to climb up and down nine flights of stairs in the dead of night. It was time for a more convenient way to dispose of the evidence. Chillingly, it came in the form of cooking and eating some of the victims. One day during the summer of 96, the first sign that evil resided within the city arose when the gangrenous severed body parts of numerous unidentifiable children were found washed up on the banks of the River Abba. This, combined with a large number of children who were disappearing or missing, led to the idea that a psychopath was roaming around the city. One of the obvious strategies employed by the law was to contact local psychiatric hospitals to ascertain if anyone had been discharged who might make a viable suspect. Sasha was discharged after killing his girlfriend, but if you remember, a big error occurred when the staff failed to properly complete the paperwork, meaning as far as the police were concerned, he was still in a secure unit, which meant he wasn't even on their radar. That was about to change. Because in October of that same year, someone knocked on his door. It turned out to be a plumber, who was sent to check the drain pipes as complaints had been made about blockages. Rather than answering the door, Sasha shouted to the guy on the other side, making excuses regarding why he couldn't open it. This was an offence. So the plumber reported this incident to the police, who then paid him a visit with permission to kick the door down. By the time they turned up, Sasha had disappeared. He was on the run. Still, they wasted no time searching his flat, where they were overwhelmed with a putrid smell, alongside a torturous crime scene. The flat was filled with blood-stained walls. Human flesh was found in breakfast bowls, and there were pots containing cooked or rotting meat. Distressingly, the torso belonging to a young female was lying in the bath. Her dismembered head was found inside the water tank. Additionally, a human ribcage was lying on the floor in the living room, and Sasha's Rottweiler was chewing on a human bone. One police officer almost fainted. Finally, they learned who the resident of this torture chamber was and that he'd been registered as still being in a psychiatric hospital despite being discharged two years earlier. Alexander Spesisev was identified as a psychopath responsible for all of this carnage, including the human body parts dumped in the River Abba with the aid of his mum. His apartment also revealed 82 sets of clothing, many of them soaked in blood, as well as 40 different pieces of jewellery stolen from his victims. Also located were Polaroid pictures of naked, traumatised children taken as they were tied to a radiator. As the evidence piled up, it became apparent that many people potentially lost their lives to this monster. One of his victims was a 15-year-old female named Olga. And when the police broke in, this young girl was lying on the sofa. Unfortunately, she was in a dire state. Her arm was broken and she'd been stabbed in the chest several times. It was essential to get her to the hospital as soon as possible, which the police did. 
while lying in her hospital bed, this courageous soul seen here on the day she was rescued managed to convey some key details about what happened to her and who exactly was involved in her imprisonment. Her statement was recorded and it was unbelievable. It turned out she was one of those three girls approached in the grocery store by the woman in her 60s who needed help carrying bags precisely a month earlier. That woman was Ludmilla. Olga said, as they entered the flat Ludmilla led them to, Sasha immediately assaulted the girls with a knife. One of them retaliated, which led to an instant death. That was only the start of their ordeal, as you then tied Olga and the other 13-year-old to his radiator, finding it pleasurable listening to them cry as he indecently assaulted them. The girl who was initially murdered was kept close by. In a terrifying way, Sasha did something that made me struggle to comprehend his mentality. He handed the girls a hacksaw, telling them to cut their friend's body up if they wanted to survive. After that, he then flushed her guts down the toilet. Olga went on to explain that he made them carry the body parts to the bathroom, where they placed her torso into the bath and her head into the water tank. The other surviving girl, who was only 13, and named Izenya, was next to die. Sasha set his dog on her, and during the attack, her trachea, a tube that's used to transport air to and from the lungs, was severed. Once she was dead, 15-year-old Olga was ordered to dismember her if she wanted to be spared. What happened next was absolutely vile. The killer and his mother used the flesh and bones to make soup and both of them ate it. They made Olga do the same as she explained this to the authorities. According to this brave 15-year-old, Sasha's sister visited during this time period, clearly aware of what was going on, including the cannibalism, and not once intervened. However, Olga didn't implicate her in the crimes. She'd simply visit, chat, and then return to her own place. It shows the, uh, the mindset of this abnormal family, don't you think? I mean, they had no interest in anyone apart from themselves, turning a blind eye for each other when necessary. Olga also explained that she actually saw Sasha's mum cutting the bodies up to cannibalise them. Tragically, after providing information that would otherwise have never have been learned, Olga passed away the following day, 24 hours after being rescued. Enough evidence was secured to immediately arrest his mother, solely based on Olga's detailed descriptions. A few days after that, Sashi was arrested. Nadezda, on the other hand, was detained for questioning and ordered to see a psychiatrist who actually assessed her as being normal. She never did face any charges, as there was no evidence linking her to the crimes. In an interview, Sashi informed his interrogators that his freezer was so full of frozen body parts at one point he was having a problem closing the door. He explained this with a smile on his face. In another interview, he was talking about his final three victims of teenage girls. His eyes lit up as he confessed that having three girls at the same time was exhilarating. He found satisfaction showing them his anger because the more he scared them, the nicer they became. What a pathetic monster. When being interrogated together, Sasha and his despicable mum sat facing each other across the room, arguing about the crimes. The son felt his mother was more involved than she was letting on. Ludmilla was trying to explain that her role was simply to help remove the bodies. In fact, initially, she denied the charges against her until the prosecutor produced Olga's recorded statement, a statement that indicated the depth of her involvement. However, neither of these two monsters were remorseful. Instead, both of them were more preoccupied with who did what. The mother was adamant that she personally never killed anyone. It made no difference in the end because she was convicted as an accomplice, being sentenced to 15 years. I believe she served less than 13 of them before her release in 2008. Sasha was charged with 19 murders that he confessed to. He was 26 at the time and his confession was supported by a diary discovered in his apartment. Unfortunately, he could only be linked to four murders, although he may have killed as many as 80 people during his violent rage as Anovica's next monster. 
He was committed to a psychiatric hospital yet again, where he remains to this very day. But the question is, what do you think about the relationship between this twisted family? And how do you feel about his mother's release, you know, her release from prison? And let's not forget what his sister witnessed. She saw them both cannibalising people and observed some of the victims in prison yet was found innocent. How does that sit with you? Well, let us know in the comment section down below. I'm Royston, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.